Before jumping into it, another quick disclaimer that we aren't electricians, but we did do quite a bit of research and planning on paper before taking on this project. We created a spreadsheet which proved to be a really valuable resource to organize the details of every circuit and tackle the job without forgetting anything. It also made figuring out our materials list way easier. If you want to get a copy of this spreadsheet and our materials list, it's available on our website. Check out the link in the description or pinned comment. Today, we start actually running wires. It's really exciting. We have a lot of the boxes mounted, not everything, but enough to get started. We are gonna be focusing mostly on the dedicated circuits today. They are the easiest ones, which is good for novice electricians. Just a point A, point B with a wire in between. That's things like our dryer, our washer, stove, or fridge. We're doing a freezer in the garage. And we might get onto some of the receptacle circuits, with our, which are like the second easiest thing because it's just one home run from the panel to a circuit box and then basically daisy chaining receptacles from there. We have some friends coming to help today, which is gonna be awesome. So we'll probably make a lot more progress than we're intending. Hopefully, none of us are electricians. So <laughs> we'll do the best we can. Shane, of course, our faithful friend who's been here many times before, will be helping pull some wire. And then Aaron and Rachel, who if you remember our engagement video, link up here, they were the ones who came and helped us lift some of the very first walls in this garage apartment. And they will be coming back to help us pull some wiring as well. Now you'll notice we do not have our duct work in yet and typically duct work goes in before wire pulling. The exception here is when the same person is doing both the wiring and the duct pulling. It's a lot easier when they're sharing a, a cavity to not have to work around the duct work. So I am conscious of where all the duct runs are going to go. And so we're not going to put wires in those spaces. In a traditional build, the electrician and HVAC installer might not have that level of communication. So that is why in this build, we're gonna do electrical before HVAC, just so that we don't have to deal with those giant duct runs in the way. So we are off to the races this morning. We already have one circuit almost done. That's the dryer, super easy. Have our double gang box. This is 10-3 wire and it basically runs right down in the utility room. It casts the jog over right here and then the utility room wall is like right here. So Shane's down there just stapling that in. Next up is the washer. That's this dedicated box here. That will get a single 12-2 Romex wire to it. That's enough. Okay, you can pull the slack back down. You'll feel it. Okay, that's good. In general, we're shooting for the middle of all the studs and plates when we're putting our wires in. Code minimum is inch and a quarter. Any closer than that, you need a nail plate. And we're nailing with these little plastic staples. These are the staples that I like the best personally because there's no risk of damaging the cable like the metal staples can do if you're not careful. These also have two individual tiny nails, which I find are easier to drive than the singular metal staple. Probably a little bit more expensive, but I don't really care. And then it's one staple within 12 inches of the box and then every four feet a minimum after that. But in general, to make it look nice, you gotta do it a little bit closer than four feet. I'm leaving about six or eight inches hanging out of the box as well. That should be plenty for wiring up our devices. This route was a little tight on the required minimum distance from the edge of the stud coming up next to the drain pipe. It did work though because the pipe was slightly off center. In hindsight, a better route would have been one stud bay to the right and crossing over the drain box, coming into the receptacle from above. Trying to keep the Romex nice and flat and neat. If you don't uncoil it um, by rolling it and rather you just pull the end of the coil, it tends to twist up and it looks really kind of not good. I don't think there's any issues like code wise or anything, but it looks like the mark of a DIYer, I guess. At the top of the box here, uh, I'm leaving about six inches, just sort of doing this with my finger to the front of the box. That should leave plenty for wiring the switch up and I'll be able to curl this back up into the box. So that's what we'll do for roughing. Try to coil this up and push it back in the box as far as we can. That way those pesky drywallers cannot cut the wire with um, their rota zip tools when they go to cut the outlets out from the drywall. Down here in the back garage, we're mounting all of the receptacles at basically workbench height, so 48 and a half to the top of the box. That's just here on the back half on the workshop. In the front half here, we're doing all basically normal receptacle height. 
The only special one we're thinking about here is a dedicated circuit there for a freezer. This box that I'm mounting here is going to be for a welder. So we're going to be running six gauge wire to this. And I just decided a metal box would be a little bit more robust for a welder circuit. But this is in our back workshop and I feel it will come in handy at some point. For this welder outlet, we're using six two Romex, two conductors, six gauge wire. There's a number of options. There's metallic cloud cable. We could have run metal raceway and pulled individual um, THHN wire or something like that. But Romex is pretty easy. Uh, it's fairly inexpensive. It's about the same price as MC cable, but I didn't feel like messing with any of the extra stripping tools and um, special connectors or whatever that MC uses. So good old standard Romex clamp, 6.2. That should get the job done. This is a fairly short run to maybe 20 feet over the electrical room. Again, we're just leaving, you know, six, six, eight inches hanging out of the box and wire our plug up to. These Romex clamps use square drive bits, which I think is kind of an electrician exclusive. For some reason, they like the square drive on everything. I'm not really sure why. Snug, but not too tight. We're ready to run it to the panel. Just up and over. This outlet between our garage doors is for our electric car. Basically the same anatomy as the welder circuit, 62 Romex. It's gonna get a 50 amp breaker, but I'm not gonna put the breaker in the panel at this point because we don't have an electric car, so I'm just gonna keep the wire spooled up for the future. This was just too funny to cut out. Get some pliers, Alex, come on. We're off to the races for wiring. Shane and Elena are working on the dedicated garage um, chest freezer circuit that we're putting in. And then Aaron and Rachel just arrived. They're getting started on our little dedicated electric fireplace circuit. We'll have sort of a built-in eventually is what we're thinking with one of those little electric fireplace space heaters that look really nice, but you don't have to worry about all the venting and the fuel gas and all that. They don't penetrate the air barrier for the house either, which was something that I care about. So we're not gonna use it as any means of like space heating. We don't care about that. It's just a little bit like a creature comfort, decorative ambiance style thing. But it is a space heater, so I'm gonna run a dedicated circuit to it. So Aaron and Rachel are working on that, pulling wire up there, drilling studs. We're making pretty good progress here for just a couple hours into the morning. Shane's over here roughing in for our dishwasher slash garbage disposal outlet. We've got 12-2 wire coming up through some um, flex conduit. There's just a few feet of this, basically just to protect this as it comes through the floor. And then I will terminate this at a junction box underneath the kitchen sink cabinet when that is finally installed. That box will feed both the disposal and the dishwasher that's right next to it. Having cabinet labels really helps everything and having that cabinetry marked out, that way we know where to actually drill this. It's a similar story with the microwave. This one being an island was even more important to mark out ahead of time because there's only so many ways we can shift this and I want to have this come up in the back of the box because there's going to be a drawer underneath this microwave base. So if this was like in the middle, that would be a no-go because the drawer couldn't close. Here's where that flex conduit ends. Like I said, you're really not supposed to run Romex in conduit, but this is just a protection sleeve. Look at, look at the look on her face when I'm she, she heard that that wasn't. You can't run Romex in full lengths of conduit. This is like three feet. It's just to protect the uh, jacketing of the Romex from future damage up there. So it's good to go. Don't worry. One by one, we're getting all the dedicated circuits in first. This is our freezer underneath the stairs. And the beauty of running the soffit is we don't have to drill through all these studs going way down the wall. We can just staple right to the face of the stud 
and we'll be building this down. This is a good demo of why we did the wiring before the ductwork because after ductwork, there would be two large sheet metal tubes here that would be really hard to work around and hard to staple up against. But now we can just run the scaffold down and run all of our wiring super easily. At the main panel, this is getting to look like a bit of a spaghetti mess, but don't worry, we're going to make it look nice and neat by the end of it. Right now, we're just trying to get the wires in place, leave plenty of extra slack so that I can get down into the box in a neat and orderly fashion and route the cable to its final breaker location in the box. I laid that out in a Google Sheet spreadsheet as well. That's really going to help organize in my head where all the breakers are gonna be, and thus where the wires should best enter the box. A lot of times electricians will just enter all of them through the top because the panels are assessed into a stud bay, but ours is surface mounted, so we can come in all four sides if we really want to. So if it means making the panel wiring a little bit neater, I won't necessarily limit myself to coming in just from the top of the box. Well, that was a whirlwind of a day yesterday with four other volunteers on site helping with the wiring. We got a lot done. It was definitely hectic. I'll probably reserve the volunteer days for when we have like very mindless, easy work, like, I don't know, landscaping, planting grass, clean up, something like that. It can be tough to manage that many people kind of all moving at once, especially when no one here, including me, is an electrician. But we had a pretty good outcome. I'm happy with the quality of the work. I've looked at it all pretty carefully. So here's what we got done. Pretty much all the dedicated home run circuits uh, we got done all but a couple. So I still have this electric car circuit here, a future electric car that's still hanging out. I gotta tidy that up. I'm working on one right now. This is our electric stove, even though we have gas. That's what that yellow gas line's for. Someday if we ever wanna switch to an induction range or something like that, I wanna have the wire there. So that's just gonna be, that's just a piece of 8.3 Romex that we'll keep there just for a future 40 amp breaker if we ever need it. But the home runs all turned out pretty nice. And the nice thing about building this soffit out down here to house all the stuff is I didn't have to drill through any of these studs. We could just staple right to the face of the studs and we still have some yet to do. I haven't run any of the home runs for like the kitchen, the two kitchen circuits or the kitchen and pantry circuit. The lighting obviously has all still not been done, but we got a good head start on the receptacles in the garage as well. So there's gonna be a circuit for these front garage receptacles and one for the rear. And it might confuse you why we ran it up so high in the wall. Well, I'm thinking about our future insulation responsibilities and we're using rock wool bats, which are 47 inches tall. I figured why not run the wire at 47 inches so that way we can put a whole insulation bat underneath of it and we don't have to cut the insulation for every piece of wire or every wire run we have. We won't be able to do this everywhere, but in spaces where it's really easy to do, like right here, it costs you a couple extra feet of wire on each receptacle, not a big deal and a little bit of pain in the butt savings down the road when we go to insulate. This is just one of those little details that a lot of electricians or tradesmen in general probably aren't thinking about, but when you're doing so much of the work yourself, I'm trying to constantly be thinking three, four, 10 steps ahead to save myself a little bit of headache down the road. We got an electrician at work down here finishing our garage circuits. Look at her go. Beautiful. What a beauty. For these high amperage circuits, I like using metal boxes. They seem just a little bit more sturdy. It's really solid. This is 8.3 Romex, like I said. It's good for a 40 amp circuit breaker, which I looked it up. Normal 30 inch induction range cooktops and ovens all specify 40 amp. This should be perfectly adequate for a whole host of oven combinations. The giant ovens require 50 amps, but that's okay. We don't really need that. I made a short form video of this which sparked controversy from Facebook's electrician community. But one good piece of advice that came from all the comments was that stoves have an open area at the bottom to accommodate a plug or gas connector. So I did end up moving both of these boxes just above the floor. 
Try to disregard the very angry faces I'm making while drilling, but this circuit is for the electric radiant floor system we're putting in the bathroom. Much more to come on that. The next box on the list is gonna go right above this garage door, basically, sort of in the center of the shop area. I'm actually gonna put two outlets here, one for a just regular receptacle in case we do need a standard garage door opener. I have the regular one over there for the side mount, but in case we do need a regular, I'll need an outlet front and center there. And I'm gonna put a 240 volt outlet net right next to it on a 30 amp circuit with some 10-3 wire. That is going to be for a future table saw or any other 240 volt tool that I wanna be located right in the middle of the shop. Rather than running an extension cord on the floor from a wall outlet, I wanna have a dongle hanging down that I can plug anything into and then I don't have to be tripping over a cord anywhere else. And I plan to have most of my equipment on uh, wheels, so sometimes I'll have the table saw in the middle, maybe I'll have a project where I need a planer or something, something high power in the middle, but that'll give me some leeway. And then I can also use the normal 120 volt outlet to put a uh, extension cord on a reel up there so I can have an extension cord anywhere in the shop easily. And there is what it looks like all mounted up. You can see that I've already started running the 10-3 wire that's gonna go to that circuit. And the one thing to mention about metal boxes is they all need to be grounded. So there's a little grounding screw lug in the boxes. It doesn't come with the screw. I had to buy a pack of screws separately, but it's gotta be a green colored grounding screw. And I've just used a piece of scrap number 10 wire here to make this little pigtail up. And that will get tied in with that ground so that that metal box is grounded and can never become electrified. All right, got that all wired up. And this is what I'm doing with these three large circuits that I don't really have space for in the panel. I guess I could probably squeeze them, but I'm trying to reserve some space for our future sub panels for the addition and for a future house. So I'm not gonna hook these up right now because we don't have an electric vehicle, we don't have electric stove, and I don't necessarily need that shop ceiling outlet right now. So, and eventually I'm going to put a sub panel somewhere to the left of our main panel here and those three will be powered off of that if we end up needing them. So for now, I'm just gonna continue pulling all the rest of the home runs. I'm just leaving them long right next to the box right now. Eventually for the rough end inspection, I just need to get them in the box and they'll just be sort of, you know, they'll be stapled outside and they'll have their clamps on them, but I'm not gonna hook any breakers up to them because obviously we don't have the outlets or the lights or anything all hooked up. So that would be dangerous if you can electrify the circuit without having the finished receptacles and lights on. So the other day when we had all those people over to come in to help do all the home runs, we ran out of Romex wire, 12-2 wire anyway. We went through three 250 foot rolls of it. So when I went to the distributor again, I was like, you know what, we still have to do the hole upstairs. I'm just gonna get a thousand foot spool. And that was probably the best decision I ever made. I'm sure electricians that hear, hear that will be like, well, uh, duh. But the spools are so much easier to work with. Check this out. This little guy was, oh, I don't know, $550 or something. That's a thousand feet of Romex, equivalent to four of those 250 foot spools. But the beauty of this is it rolls off so smoothly. The wire comes off just straight as an arrow. It makes it 10 times easier to get a good looking run. These couple wires were run with the 250 foot roll being conscious of trying to unroll it very carefully, not just pulling it so that it twists coming off the spool. And they look okay, but then when you come over here, this one was run with the spool. It is just laser straight. I am so glad we got the spool before we finished all the rest of the receptacles upstairs. Holy smokes, that thing looks beautiful. It's not to say you can't get a good looking one off the 250, it's just a lot more work. Like this one was off a 250 foot spool and it looks pretty, pretty straight. I mean, I can't really tell on any, any different, but it is just a lot easier to accomplish with the thousand foot spool. I'm finally done with all the wire pulling for the downstairs in 12-2, all the receptacles anyway, not the lighting yet. I'm gonna do all the receptacles, all the 12-2 yellow wire first and then move on to all the lighting just to keep that straight in my head. Otherwise, I just get way too overwhelmed with what circuits, what, where, what hole we're drilling where. So now I'm going to be on to the second floor receptacle. So all of the kitchen, the main living space, bedrooms, bathrooms. And I'm going to start just by drilling everything. Um, I've got my three quarter inch auger bit in my right angle drill. And I'm gonna just mark out level lines to make sure this is nice and neat looking. Um, I want this to look like a professional job. I'm not an electrician by any means, but 
I want to make it look like an electrician did this work so that when the inspector comes, he doesn't throw any flags or anything like that. Although he really likes us and appreciates what we're doing and notices that we take care to get the details right and take our time and do things by the book. So we should be good. I did ask him ahead of time that he's okay with me doing my own electrical rough in and he had no problems with that. So let's get to drilling. I recommend investing in a set of quality auger drill bits. These I got from Harbor Freight and yes, they did work, but they definitely showed their wear quickly. Would you just look at that? Gosh, the laser makes things so easy to get looking nice. This one's gonna be tricky. So I can get this auger bit in here. This is just slightly too small of a space to get this in here with the drill. Same on the other side. And of course, this is too small of a space to get the 18 inch bit in. It's just a 14 inch stud bay. Might have to drill my way in. There we go. My little angle drill does not like this. This is not a heavy duty drill. Oh gosh, it's making some bad noises. Something's burning. Oh, it's my drill motor. Holy smoke. Literally, holy smokes, it's smoking. Oh, come on, girl. Oh my gosh. Poor DeWalt. completes the drilling for the receptacle circuits. I'm gonna handle lighting on a different day just cause that's a whole different part of my brain right now. It's about 1230. If I work my butt off, I think we can get all of the wire pulled for the re receptacles up here by the end of the day. I'm sure this is something uh, one or two electricians could do in probably like two hours, but I don't work quite that fast as, as a first timer. So I'm just gonna see how far I can get by the end of the day. I think I'm gonna pull all the home runs last I already have the holes drilled, I know where they're gonna be, but it's gonna get dark up here. I don't have lighting while well, I do have lighting down in the garage. So I can always pull the home runs later this evening when it's light down there, but dark up here. So I'm just gonna start by bringing my thousand foot reel up here, setting it right in the middle and just start stringing all the different outlets together. I've seen a tip that I think makes sense if I can get it to work. Now that I have nice level straight holes and I drilled at angles around corners, I should be able to just pull a whole string of Romex all the way around a room and then basically at the receptacles just tug excess slack at those locations to go down to the receptacles. That seems like it'll be faster than just kind of chopping it up and doing it one little string at a time. Although that way does work too. We did pretty much all the garage like that, but I'm going to try this different technique up here. Oh my gosh, $500 of solid copper it is not light. This little reel worked so incredibly well it is just not even comparable how much easier it is to just gently tug on this thing and get whatever wire you need off from you know 25 feet away you're not constantly trying to unkink it this is just complete game changer never wiring off a spool like that again if I can help it. I'm gonna start with the kitchen circuit. The home run's gonna come right up through this floor plate. This is a little bit close to the face of the stud. I'll need a nail plate here. There happens to be a giant LVL underneath this wall. So this is the furthest in that I could get it. 
One other quick note is we made a point to cut out our HVAC registers before we pulled all the home runs and stuff up here, just so we had an idea where the ductwork was going to sit so that we didn't cross the path of the joist bay where there's gonna be a duct run. We're gonna go parallel and staple right to the side of the joist so the wires will be out of the way of our future ducts that are gonna go in here. So I'll start this run just by pulling through this line of holes here. We're just gonna see how this works. This is gonna be kind of an experiment. So the goal is just to get this in this line of holes all the way around the room, and then we'll see if we can easily pull slack out for the receptacle locations. So there's quite a few of them along this wall. One note about kitchens is they do require two small appliance circuits. So this one will feed basically the L of the kitchen. I'll actually have three, I guess. I'll have one in the island that's dedicated to the microwave and two outlets. And then I'll have one that serves kind of a pantry slash dry bar area where a lot of our countertop appliances will be stored. You know what? I missed the hole. <laughs> it's a bummer. So far, so good. This thing is pull pulling really smoothly off the reel, which I would expect in a perfectly straight run of wall with a perfectly straight line of holes. Key is gonna be come, when we come around this corner. Oh shoot, and it's boxed off. I almost forgot. How the heck am I gonna get that around that corner? There's another stud here right this way, and then this one forms basically a U-shaped box right here, so I can't easily access the back of this. And there's this giant roof beam here and this giant header here. So this is kind of a closed off box. I'm gonna have to try to fish a tape or something through there to pull that wire through. That didn't turn out nearly as bad as I thought. I just went in here with this hooked piece of scrap wire, put that in here, then put my fish tape here, and the fish tape has a little ring on the end of it. I was able to hook it with the scrap wire, pull the fish tape through, tape it to my Romex, now we got the Romex through. Continuing on. Now that the first corner's in the mix, it definitely doesn't want to pull quite as easily, but it's still going. Just gotta get to the other side of this window. Now, astute code observers might notice that the minimum countertop spacing of outlets is four feet. And we have a very large window here that presents a problem for outlets. So we have one on either side of the window they are not four feet apart. And they're also not two feet from the edge of the kitchen sink, which is another rule. But I called our inspector and asked him this very thing. And he said, it's just fine. Put one on either side of the window. I feel it's kind of a dated rule. I don't really understand why that still applies behind these kitchen sinks where now we have large windows like this one. It just doesn't make sense. They have products that you can do like pop-up countertop outlets and these things called sill lights that embed into a wooden window sill to give you that plug there but I just think it's silly and just sort of a waste. You know, I'm never plugging something in directly next to the sink, so it doesn't really seem to benefit much by doing that. All right, this is, this is going. I'm pretty impressed. Having all the holes in a perfectly straight line definitely helped. That laser level is the way to go. I'm definitely liking this technique. It just is so much more convenient to get the wires the length you want them because you have like an infinite spool coming off one end. Just need a little bit more slack, you can pull it. This is, I got one in work here, but I've done one. So this is an example of what I'm gonna try to do for most of these outlets. This is a service loop, a little bit extra wire in case one gets damaged during drywall or something, you can pull more in. I didn't do this on the garages, but I thought kind of, I had kind of second thoughts up here. I figured, you know what, I probably should put the service loop in just in case something gets nicked. I'm not tearing too much in, especially because we're gonna have the Sega vapor barrier, the Sega Myrex here. So I really don't ever wanna tear into these walls again if I don't have to. There's a whole host of code requirements regarding electricity, obviously. So this is why most people just hire electricians, but I've taken it upon myself to learn a lot of these. The book is like this thick. I don't think anyone really knows all of it, but residential electricity, the rules are pretty straightforward for the most part. I mean, you gotta have six inches coming out of the box. You can, you gotta have a staple within, I think it's 12 inches of the box, but you're allowed 18 inches of slack for something like this service loop. The heights of the boxes all have rules around them. The drilling of the holes has to be within the middle of the stud. I think it's within an inch and a quarter of the edge of the stud. So there's just all kinds of little minute details that 
If you're gonna do your own electrical work, you really gotta take the time to learn all that ahead of time because you can't really undrill a hole. I guess, I guess you could pull a wire out and redo it. But life will be a lot easier if you just learn the rules ahead of time. I think I've learned the ones that pertain to residential electricity for the most part. But if you're an electrician and you see something that I'm doing that you don't think agrees with code, please feel free to put it in the comments. Cite the code article while you're there. That helps me go back and try to understand what the issue is. But in general, I feel like I know it well enough to do what I'm doing here and hopefully I don't get myself into trouble. All right, just about an hour later, this whole wall is wired. I've got service loops and everything. I wrote on all the ends of the cables in my own terms so that I know where the cables are going to and coming from when it comes time to wire everything up. And I just left the Romex hanging out of the box for now. I'm gonna come back all in one pass and strip all the insulation off the Romex, get the wires tucked up in the box where they need to be. That's really all that's needed for rough and inspection is just have the Romex stripped off, the wire curled up in the back of the box. At that point, I'll tie the grounds and neutrals together as well. And then when the time comes to hook up all the receptacles, all I have to do is hook up the actual plug. Now to repeat this process through every other receptacle up here, which is quite a few. After a couple sweaty days of wiring in what feels like an attic, we finally tied together all the receptacle circuits and we're ready to run the home runs. Oh my gosh, he's excited. The very last thing I got to do is just take home runs from specified boxes that I've already drilled holes for below to go down into the soffit where we're running all the rest of the home runs and go all the way back to the main panel. Big shout out to subscriber Eric Jorgensen for double checking our thoughts through the circuit planning process and giving some great suggestions. Like I mentioned, if you'd like to get the spreadsheet we made to help with your own electrical project, it's available on our website through the link in description or pinned comment. As always, thanks for watching and we'll see you on the next one.